I'm Terry Gilliam, and I have a confession to make. Many of you are not going to like this film. Many of you, luckily, are going to love it. And then there are many of you who aren't going to know what to think when the film finishes. But hopefully you'll be thinking. I should explain. This film is seen through the eyes of a child. If it's shocking, it's because it's innocent. So I suggest you try to forget everything you've learned as an adult. The things that limit your view of the world, your fears, your prejudices, your preconceptions. Try to rediscover what it was like to be a child with a sense of wonder and innocence. And don't forget to laugh. <laughs> Remember, children are strong. They're resilient. They're designed to survive. When you drop them, they tend to bounce. That's not true, by the way. I was 64 <laughs> years old. <laughs> I was 64 years old when I made this film. I think I finally discovered the child within me. It turned out to be a little girl. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So that that's the very first thing that that uh, opened up um, when you bought the DVD for Tideland. That's the first thing you saw as the director of the movie coming out and basically giving you like a disclaimer. Uh, or it sounds like a semi-apology almost, like. Hey, I made this movie. I think maybe a lot of you aren't going to really like it or understand it, but try to keep an open mind, you know? Well, I mean, have you heard of the movie A Serbian Film? Yeah, uh, the I've director, seen a Serbian the, film. The director for that movie did something similar, only he did it like publicly in the theater. He's like, Yeah, you guys want to take a shot of vodka, get some lemon, squeeze it in your eye because you're probably not going to like this movie. Um, <clears throat> sorry. But. I actually liked this movie. Uh, I'd never heard of it before. I, I thought it was like the Big Lebowski, like part two, almost, because it has Jeff Bridges in it, and uh, he's awesome in every movie that he's in. Uh, he right, does a lot of right. movies like these, though. Like I wouldn't say like messed up movies, but he's just like him as an actor. I wouldn't. Say, he's not in a lot of blockbuster movies. He's in a lot of indie films, kind of like this. The Big, the Big Lebowski is a big budget film, but it feels like an indie film. Um, yeah, like. At first, I was a little turned away from this movie, but it got interesting. Once I saw the little girl with the syringe, and you you know that it's a heroin or something like that. And she gives right. it to her father like it's like no big deal at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> and then her mom is just off her rocker also. <laughs> like Mom's like, oh, I love you. But then she slaps her for trying to take chocolate. It's like, oh, you're right. it's bitch. very It's very over the top. Um, the acting is very over the top, especially... Um, well, from from everybody, but especially at the beginning of the film, I think the Terry Gilliam just has a, his films are very uh, visually stunning. They're very um, uh, disorienting. The the his cinematography is very disorienting and chaotic. The set pieces are always kind of a just. There's a lot of chaos. You know, there's a lot of movement and a lot of chaos. I I really enjoy Terry Gilliam's films. I think uh, this is. Probably my second favorite of his films, um, the first being Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Have you ever seen that that movie? Oh, yeah. I've seen Fear. Yeah, I love that movie. Actually, I remember watching that movie the first time a long time ago, and then my mom walked in the room. She's like, what the hell are you watching? I'm like, how have you not seen this? <laughs> yeah, the... The thing is, though, you know, that the, that was actually his last film that he made before making Tideland. I think there was a pretty there was a pretty long gap. And, the, you know, before we get into this movie, I just want to read some of the the reason that I brought because I recommended that we do this movie today. And the reason is because this is a, an example of a film that is, you know, we're doing horror films on this show and I appreciate horror and I like uh like I, my knowledge of horror films is more like seventies, eighties, nineties, or early nineties horror films. Yeah. And um, I really, I don't like that the direction the genre has gone in. I I don't like the the gross out films. I don't like the torture porn stuff. I I just I I don't. I feel like the the formulaic aspect of horror has gotten to the point where it's just. It's like it goes into one direction where people are like, let's see how far we can push this. You know, let's let's see how grotesque we can make this. And then in the other direction, there's just really formulaic horror films that are they're just not they're not fun to watch. And I I see this film, Tideland, as kind of a, a, a masterpiece of horror. And it's not even really a horror film. It's more like a, a fantasy kind of. But it has these these horror elements. It gets horrifying. It's it's a much more terrifying film, I think, than any any modern horror. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't really know. I haven't seen a lot of modern horror because I just I I'm turned off by it. But this was released in I want to say 2006, 
And when it came out, it was um, a lot of people did not like it. It was critically panned. I, I, but I think it's actually gotten a little bit. I think it has more of a cult following now. Uh, not to the status of it being a cult film, but it definitely has. Uh, it, it, people, I think, appreciate it more now than they did then. I just want to read some a few things that uh, people reviewed this movie when it came out. Um, let's see. This one is from Cinema Blend. It says, Tideland is a movie so vile, pointless, and offensive that it really ought to come with a warning label. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it's that offensive. Um, there are some artistic choices. Like, well, one thing that people were really upset about is the fact that there's a scene where there's a couple of scenes actually where a grown man's kissing a young girl. But the thing is, the right. point of that was the the guy he's mentally disabled. He he's a child in his mind. He thinks he's like five years old or something like that or eight. And yeah, I mean, I see why people are offended. But the like I said, the point of that was that guy was like mentally re- retarded. I I don't, I don't want to offend people, but that's the truth. He was mentally retarded. And the the entire movie is seen through the eyes of this little girl. And like when I was watching this movie. Um, uh, one of my friends was over, and I was watching this movie. I actually watched this movie twice. When I watched it the second time, my fr- my friend was like, uh, he he thought there was, there was something wrong with that girl. Like, what's wrong with that girl? And I just thought, there's nothing wrong with her. She's just being a kid. So it's weird. You got two different aspects. One person says, like, oh, there's something wrong with this girl. Like, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with her. She's just being a kid. So I think that is the point of the movie where you're just – it looks disturbing from an adult point of view. But from a child's point of view, it's not that bad. Like, her dad gets taxidermied or something like that in the middle of this movie. Um, there's a lot of things that would offend or disturb an adult in this movie, but it doesn't phase her whatsoever. Like, her dad literally gets, like, turned into this taxidermy. I think that's the word for it. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, that, that would bother any adult. But she's seen it through, like, her own little world. And her her own little friends are these little doll heads. And whenever she loses one, it's, like, a big deal to her. But that's the only thing she has. And, like, there's nothing to do in this farm or this land that they're at. It's just him. It's just her. Uh, I forgot the name. The Dixon. I think that's the name. The retarded guy. And then uh, there's the old lady. The old lady is off Dickens. her rocker. Yeah, Dickens. 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 Uh, the old lady's off her rocker. I... Uh, She's 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 terrifying. Like she switches Del. throughout the whole movie. Like she's a nice lady, then she's like, "Oh, where's the squirrel? Did you just take my, did you, did you just take my plants or whatever? What are you doing? Are you trespassing?" Blah blah blah. And I like the photography for this movie. It, it reminds me of a a series of unfortunate events and a couple other movies that have a lot of gray, but like orange sticks out like a lot. I, I like that type of cinematography. So yeah, I can see why people were turned off by this movie. But I don't know. I was just intrigued by it. I wouldn't say it's like my favorite film all the time, but it's definitely up there, like the top 100 films I would watch again. Like I would watch this movie again. Yeah, definitely not my favorite film, but I, I it just has a, a poignancy that that I, I don't know. You, you you made a good point you, you, when you talked about the sort of dichotomy of Dell's uh, behavior. On one hand, she she was she was very sweet. She could be very sweet, and. Uh, you know, kind of almost motherly to that, to, to what was her name was Jeliza, Jeliza Rose, Jeliza, Jeliza Rose, Jeliza Rose. Rose. She, she could almost be like motherly to her. She seemed to care for her. And then she would just snap and go off into that other direction being, you know, like really violent and verbally abusive. But you see that that's kind of the, a big part of this film is, is the, the, is dichotomy the right word? Is this kind of contrast between two extremes? Uh, you know, the film is about, it, I mean, partially about innocence and these horrific events that are viewed through the eyes of somebody that is that is innocent. Um, and I think that's a that's a big theme in the movie. You know, it's the obviously these horrible, grotesque, these awful things that if they were framed in a different way. I feel like they would be less grotesque. Like if, if it was framed, if it was just a straight horror film and it was not framed as sort of a fantasy that's perceived through the eyes of a child, I think it would be a lot. I think it would be less impactful because the, the, the tragedy of it is that you do see the, you know, you do see these things as kind of, there's always this glimmer of hope in it because it's seen through somebody, through the eyes of somebody that doesn't really understand what's happening. And I think that gives it a, a weight 
that otherwise you wouldn't be able to have for a, a you know a film like this or the with themes like this. Her mother was the same way. You know, her mother died at the beginning of the film, and uh, she was the same way. She she you know she cycled through these emotions like she was verbally and physically abusive and then grabbing onto her daughter and saying I love you and then hitting her again. I want to, for people who haven't seen the movie, I want to just give a brief summary of the film, okay? So this girl, uh, uh, Jeliza Rose, Jel is it? Jeliza. Jeliza Rose. Yeah. She, she's, uh, she basically carries this film. It's, it's a, a film that's about her, and uh, it's largely about a, a fantasy life that she constructs as a result of being abandoned by her parents. Uh, her parents are both junkies. Her mother dies uh, at the beginning of the film from what I, I think it was a methadone overdose or some complication yeah. due to methadone, which is a drug that's used to um, to help people uh, come off of heroin. Her father is a heroin addict, and uh, he freaks out. They both freak out when the mother dies, and the father uh, – what was his name? I forgot his name. I forgot his name. I know he's Jeff Bridges. Yeah, yeah, because he's really not – yeah, Jeff Bridges, who was awesome in this movie, even though he's pretty much a corpse through the whole movie. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, she, she, they go, they take a bus to this, uh, basically just kind of like a, a Texas wasteland. Um, I don't know if they ever specified Texas, but the novel was the novel Tideland was set in Texas. Oh well, yeah, they, uh, they didn't. They just, they never said it was based in Texas in the movie, but when I looked it up, like in the credits, when I was because it said it was based on a book, and when I found out that the movie set in Texas, like well, that makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of part in Texas where it's just an open field, just like that, lots of weeds. Right. I've seen a lot of abandoned houses in Texas, kind of like that too. Um, right, right, right. I don't know. You, you have a, you probably haven't been to Texas in a while, I guess, maybe like a couple years. Uh, but right, yeah, there's a lot of abandoned houses like that in the middle of nowhere. You can go to an open field, and like, oh, what's that? Um, when I was a kid, I would adventure out in open plains a lot with my friends, and we would just find houses like that. So that reminded me of a lot of being a kid. And that girl, uh, Joe Julie M Mika Mika, I don't I don't know if I'm saying it right, but oh my god, July is Rose, like that actress, she's amazing. I she was so good in yeah. this movie. I was impressed. Um, I see why she was casted. And she she's such a, such a talented actress and like she acts really mature in this movie, um, like uh, Cherry Gilligan he he focuses so much on her face uh, on her facial expressions and it's weird because she goes back and forth from like like there's a part in the scene where she spits blood out of her mouth and instead of being worried about it she goes oh my god I'm dying and she starts playing with herself so like all around the house and like you just coughed up blood you're not going to be concerned about that but she's not concerned about it it's like oh she starts making up this whole fantasy throughout the whole movie every time something bad happens she makes up another story in her head like what's happening uh yeah right. sorry keep going R right she um she and i think I, I i have this kind of idea about what was actually happening in this movie um i'm not so, well, okay, let me let me go back and just explain what we're talking about because anyone who hasn't seen the movie will be, will be confused. Uh, her and her father come to this house, this sort of – it's like an abandoned house in the middle of this – just basically a barren wasteland. There's like one tree. Everything's dead. There's a train track you know, going through this, this big open field, and there's not much around. And uh, – Whoever Jeff Bridges' character is, uh, he tells his daughter that this was his mother's house. And I guess if you believe everything that happened in the, the film actually happened or if you believe the people that she met, her neighbors are actually people that existed in the real world, then I guess it really was his mother's house. But maybe it wasn't. I don't know. He says it was his mother's house. They go and it's basically this derelict abandoned property. Uh, she, he gives her some, I guess, some heroin to, to, to prepare for him to shoot up and she shoots him up and he dies. He overdoses that night and he's pretty much sitting in his chair for the rest of the film and he's just dead. But because she's used to him, you know, uh, he calls these, when he, when he takes heroin, he calls them vacations. You know, he, if anyone's ever seen the person on heroin, they kind of nod off. They just basically fall asleep for long periods of time. So she's used to this. Uh, so she just thinks he's on this extended vacation sitting in his chair. And once the audience becomes aware that, that he's actually dead, I'm not sure. She just doesn't accept it at the time or she just 
I'm not sure if she knows that he's dead. There's a lot of, of that in, in this movie. A lot of spe- – you could speculate as to you know how – what's actually happening, what she's actually thinking. I yeah, think, there I think she, yeah. Uh, no, sorry. He, uh, there, there's a lot of speculatory parts in this movie. Um, there's one particular per, uh, part of this movie where Jelias Rose goes to that crazy woman's house, right? And in the house, she has pictures of her dad that she, I guess, stole. But it's also pictures of that woman with her dad. And, and earlier in the movie, she mentions, like, you're never going to go away from me again, blah, 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 blah. So at one point, did these two have a relationship? Like, there's a lot of parts in this movie that makes you like question like were they in a relationship at some point did the jeff bridges character know this person at some point I, I, or uh i think it, and it then, was imp- it was implied yeah. that they that they did yeah and, and then there's noah uh i mean uh, dickens dickens i know was the dad i just figured out uh dickens mentions like oh i used to go over to meet the gra- the grandma of this house until she fell and broke her neck which he also implies that she may have sexually abused Dickens at some point. I I, right. I think that's but he he's totally unaware. He basically explains, oh, she would kiss me until so, I was you know cute, blah 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 blah. So yeah, there's a lot of subtle messages in this movie, and there's like a big reference to uh, Alice in Wonderland. There's like a lot of rabbit yeah. hole references, like go deep down the rabbit hole, and uh, the way they film holes in this movie, like the the there would be like overblown she would find this little crack on the floor or this little hole in the, on the floor and she would like look in the ground and like it would expand and there's another part in this movie where she like kind of swims in this ocean like out of nowhere and like i'm trying to like is this really her imagination that she's dreaming or is this is this what she's really thinks is happening like there's a lot of questions in this movie that it leaves you right right i and that's the, the, the ambiguity is kind of a big part of it too you know after after he dies, she kind of doesn't accept that he's dead, and she goes off into her own world that is just a world in her imagination. Like she's got – like you said, she's got these doll heads that she wears on her fingers, and they kind of – I think they represent different aspects of, of her. of her. And she ventures off into the fields, and she ends up meeting her neighbors who are very strange people. Like one – her neighbor is this woman that was – she lost one of her eyes due to a bee sting, and I guess she's allergic to bees, so she wears this like black garb and one of those bee masks. I don't know what they're called on her face yeah. to protect her bee from bee thing, stings. Yeah. yeah, she and she claims that her mother had was killed by bees. So I guess her father was a beekeeper, and then her mother was killed by these bees. And her bro- this woman her name is Dell her brother is this mentally handicapped dude that um his name is Dickens that uh this little girl uh Jeliza sort of falls in love with or has this little puppy dog romance thing with and throughout the course of this film he's sort of it becomes as it goes on it becomes more and more grotesque Visually and also the things that are happening on screen. And a, a lot of it was designed uh, specifically to make the viewer uncomfortable. The thing is, because you mentioned a Serbian film at the beginning of this. And I think a, a major difference between this and a Serbian film, other than a, a Serbian film is an artless piece. I, I mean, there's no art. It's just like, let's see how far we can push you know, the envelope and show people horrible things and then the audience gasps and it's all terrible and but it it's artless and it doesn't really have much of a point. They could come out and say, "Oh, there's these political, you know, we were politically motivated to make this film and there's all these political messages." But at the end of the day, a Serbian film is an artless piece of trash. It's a horrible movie. It, yeah, it's, it's it, not a, yeah. a Serbian film was just made to disturb people. Like I, that movie has no artistic value. I would never watch it again. Once I watched it the first time, there's they they just made that movie just to make a snuff film or whatever you want to call it it's online with a, a human centipede but this movie it's definitely an, an an entire painting like every shot can be like a painting it could be like its own photography photo that they could sell um yeah i thought the entire movie was like a painting and like they filmed it really well and i i have more respect for terry gilligan right now because i didn't realize he was that visually uh 
a, a, a genius. Like he's a genius visually. And like, like I said, every shot can literally be a painting. And that's why I, I like this film because it was one giant art piece. Yeah. It has disturb disturbing aspects, but it's not like a Serbian film. It's definitely nowhere near like that. I can see why people didn't like this movie, but at the same time, I, I enjoyed it simply before the, photography the movie the movie really has no real plot it's just a movie about a girl in the middle of nowhere somewhere in texas like just being by herself and having imagination other than that it has no real plot there's no gold there's no evil person to take down i guess one can argue that her neighbor's the evil one but yeah like there's no real plot in this movie it's just a movie about a girl just being herself just having an imagination and i thought that was an in interesting aspect uh, the movie ends <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but yeah, what are you saying? Well, the thing, you know, that goes back to the, the, the contrast. There, there was no good or evil in this movie. The, you know, the, like, for instance, Dickens, the relationship that she developed with him was very uncomfortable and it was supposed to be uncomfortable, but it, it, he was not a, an antagonist in that sense. I think that he yeah. had a little bit of an awareness that, that the relationship was wrong. I think he understood that, but at the same time, yeah, you know, he had, he had he had the sort of the mind of a child, and it got very close, especially when they were in the in his bedroom. It, you know, it got very close to being something that could have you know that could have been that could have gotten out of hand. You know, because he is an adult and she's a kid. Obviously, she had some internalized sexualized knowledge as well. So you know, who I, you you could speculate as to what happened to her because she was neglected and basically abandoned by her parents probably since she was born and it was also implied that she had uh that she was born uh addicted to whatever to heroin i guess yeah that, um oh, i didn't realize that that makes sense actually it, yeah her her mom had, had made some comments when she was talking um when she was rubbing her legs at the very beginning of the film about her being a, a draw dope baby or whatever but i think you know this this film like her all the things that happened cuz there's obviously fantastical things that took place that didn't really happen i think it's interesting to speculate about what what did actually happen in that film you know c c because it, you really she could have been alone through the whole film it could have been just her like digging really deep into uh her subconscious mind and pulling out all this stuff that are sort of representations of things that she'd seen in the past. Because the, it's a movie. The movie's main focus, the main theme of the movie is isolation and loneliness and um, kind of like dealing with being alone and the fear of being alone. Because that, that theme comes up again and again is, is the wanting to hold on to something that's no longer there and not accepting that things change and that things die and trying to move on past that. Even to the point where at the end, you know, this, there's this other body <laughs> like, you know, that they had kept alive of this, this woman there, the Dell's mother that she had kept alive in the bed with the shrine. And she was kind of obsessed with, like bringing this woman back and when she was embalming or not embalming, but I guess taxidermying uh, Noah, his name was Noah, right? Yeah. When she uh, was, when she was, when she was doing the taxidermy on him, she said something to the effect of like, you know, we don't have to accept death. Like death's not the end. It's, you know, or, or I don't, I don't remember exactly what it, what, what it was that she said, but it was implying that, we can just pretend it didn't happen and just just keep going. And the whole film is kind of an allegory of that because you know when she, this little girl, I'm not certain if she did understand that her father was dead. I know at some point that she did, but it never explicitly stated when that actually took place. But as it, the movie goes along, and I think she becomes more aware of what of what's going on around her, she kind of delves more and more into this fantastic, like this fantasy world. And I'm not sure her neighbors even existed. I mean, I know that's an extreme take on it, but I'm not even sure that, that those were real people. Well, uh, going back to what you said about Dickens, like uh, saying that he was probably aware of what he was doing. Uh, I don't know. I, the whole movie, I didn't get the impression that he understood mentally like the relationship with her was wrong. Uh, I think, you know, he literally had the mind of a kid. So when they're in the whole bed scene and they're kissing, I don't think neither of them really realize what sex is, you know? Like, they, they have an idea, but they don't understand it. Like, 
uh, there's a part of the movie where they kiss and she's like oh maybe i'm pregnant and, like there's a lot of like weird sexual innuendos like throughout the whole film but they they all start like in the middle of the movie but uh i i yeah, I, I I did feel a little uncomfortable at s some scenes, but at the same time, I felt, well, Dickens, I don't think he truly knows what he's doing. Now, if, if this was a character that knew what he was doing with this eight-year-old or whatever, then that would be an issue. That would be a major fucking issue. But, uh, like I said, I... In defense of Dick, uh, Dickens, I don't think he truly understood what he was doing. And all the sexual windows between the two characters, I don't think neither of them really understood what they were talking about. And then, like... Uh, some point in the film, sh she catches the glass. Oh, I gotta I keep saying glass. Eye, the the blind eyed woman. She catches her having sex with like I guess a guy that was from the town. And that's another thing in the movie. They keep mentioning this town, like oh they went in the town, blah blah blah. But they don't show any town. So it makes you wonder like how far are these people? Where is this town? What are they talking about? And they live right next to this mine. I guess there's like a big uh, there's like detonation explosions like every day. And throughout the whole film, you hear explosions, but you don't know what they are. But it kind of goes with the atmosphere because they're in the middle of nowhere. You don't hear anything. You just hear the wind. But off in the distance, you hear this giant explosion. I don't know if that's supposed to be a reference to something, but I felt like that was a good artistic value for all those shots. But I'm trying to like wonder what Terry Gilligan was trying to say or what I haven't read the book either. I'm just wondering what the book was trying to say. What are they trying to say? Like, uh, Children don't understand, like, they don't understand sexual in, in the windows, they don't understand what's going on, or that they're <clears throat> that oblivious to the world, or, I, I is he trying to force I, I, her, I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read the book, I, I, so I have no idea what happens in the book, I, I, I might read the book when I have some time, but I think my interpretation of, of the film is that the entire thing took place in the girl's head. I, I'm not certain about her, her neighbors, if they were, if her neighbors were actually real people or if they were constructed from her, from her fantasy because the film is about being alone. <clears throat> but I think that at the end, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a train wreck at the end, this train uh, derails and, She's sort of going through the wreckage of this train, and there's all these people that are confused and walking around, like, right after this this train accident. <clears throat> and I feel like that – and there are three times when, when I think there were real, actual people that this girl was encountering. One was when she, when she was on the bus, <clears throat> and there were actual people on the bus, you know, and her father was there with her. The second time was when she looked – over the the hill and saw all the construction equipment because they were doing so yeah. i don't know what they were building they were doing something the, it, it was a mine it was a mine thing i think they're just looking for like minerals or oil or whatever uh because controlled yeah. explosions that's what i was mentioning earlier yeah and then the third time was when um when the, the train accident happened which i think i think is supposed to be something that actually took place but i think everything else is sort of open to to speculation or open to interpretation because of how there are a lot of, of weird correlations, you know, like for instance, her, her father gets taxidermied by this woman, Dale, who just so happened to have had a relationship with her father in the past and had pictures of him mm -hmm. and of them together. And she had also taxidermied her own mother and put her in the bed just in the same way that she, and, and I feel like it's a strange correlation for a film that, that obviously takes itself seriously. I, I I don't think that it's necessarily a fantasy film in the in the sense of something that is supposed to have actually taken place. I think it's just I think it's supposed to be something that took place inside this girl's head. I, I'm not entirely certain because I don't. It's kind of a confusing movie. The perspective is kind of confusing. Like there are times when like she went down into that that hole, the rabbit hole. She kind of fell down there, you know, and the, the, there was a time when the doll heads were the, – the two doll heads were floating around in her dad's rib cage, and they gave the they gave the, the other doll, the doll that had fallen into the hole, they gave her a new brain. And then there's a time when, like, the, there's all this water that comes into the house, and she's swimming around in the water. And obviously those things – those are, are things that took place in her imagination. So I think the line between what was real and what was fantasy is, 
it, it's up to you as the viewer as to where you want to put that line. But I think I prefer to put it really, really far into the direction of that nothing really was happening. And, and the girl was just – she was just dealing with – she was dealing with neglect and she was also dealing with – um isolation and also she was hungry right she was just eating yeah. out of that peanut butter jar well i, I guess so, she kept finding fruit like in the middle of the field like uh, they had like oranges or whatever uh, but i do think that the two characters dickens and i keep forgetting the older woman's name i think those two yeah. characters did exist but it was everything else in the movie that's questionable like there's some parts of the movie they don't explain how do they get from point a to point b like she faints in the middle of the field and wakes up in her house or she's with Dickens in the middle of the field and suddenly she ends up by herself somewhere. Um, yeah, it's heavily implied that Dickens, he stole some dynamite from the construction site and he wanted to blow up that train because he thought it was a shark. And he ends up, I guess he ends up doing it because they don't mention Dickens after that. They don't say like, did he survive? You just see the older woman look, look, going around looking for Dickens, and she goes, "Oh, my captain is gone." I think she realizes that Dickens might have blown himself up and the train. Uh, that's why I really believe that Dickens is uh, was really mentally handicapped. He really had no idea what he was doing because he thought the whole movie. He had this uh, this guy. He was handling like dangerous things. He's handling like shotgun shells, dynamite. He apparently had more explosives somewhere. Um, he's even helping that woman taxidermy animals so it, it's really disturbing to see like how far this old older lady went to teaching like teaching dickens like how to taxidermy animals and you see him playing with all these dynamite i don't know i just i, I kind of felt sorry for the dickens character but also felt sorry for the girl more because she truly had no idea what was going on but i think in the end she may be kind of mentally fucked up in a way also even though i said constantly that she's normal but at the end of the movie, when they're sitting on the train, and I guess another woman sees her, and she goes, I'm hungry. It's weird, because the whole movie is this, like, giant train ride from, like, one crazy scene to another. But as soon as she sees, like, one of the survivors of the train, suddenly she just throws all the imagination away. She's like, oh, I'm hungry. I want some food, blah, 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 blah. And then she brings the woman brings the, her over, and the, suddenly the movie just ends. She goes, oh, do you right, see the but- fireflies? Yeah. But but the thing is, though, it was just her just wandering around in the field and imagining things. She, I mean, that's a that's an appropriate response, isn't it? Like if she had been, I don't know how long her, her father was dead, but, you know, if she hasn't, even if she just, I mean, if her father died and she honestly did just happen to have neighbors that were, that were, the woman was insane, and her brother was was had some kind of a, of a mental handicap. Um, she, you know, it, it that kind of sucks for her because she was just surrounded by just illness, you know, mental illness and developmental illness, and so that it, she had bad bad luck, I guess, you know, because you would hope if if you were in a situation like that and you were a child and you needed help that you would have neighbors that would that could help you but instead her neighbors just like cut her father up and like you know and turned him yeah. into a leather like a leather man and stuck him in bed like repainted the house which also by the way there was a lot of symbolism in that scene too you know they went through and they went through and tried to kind of make make that horrible place presentable it was kind of like representing this I don't know if it was an acceptance or a transition between like or a rebirth, you know, like she had made him reborn. And he also uh uh uh, uh what's his name? Dickens had said at, you know at the end she, she the the little girl she said that this house is creepy, it's filled with dead animals and he's like they're not dead, you know. Dell brought them back to life like Jesus. She's like Jesus. Yeah, and I think that that scene when they went and they yeah. they repainted the house that was like a symbolic of like regeneration. But it but also at the same time, it's recognized that it's a false sense of of regeneration because they're just painting over horrible like they're painting over shit. You know, like they like yeah. they didn't actually do anything to fix her life. They didn't do anything to fix the house. They just they just tried to make it presentable, but in doing so, it kind of made it even more, even more horrible, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it was just like this off white, like, horribly painted house. And they're sitting around having dinner with this dead body. And 
Oh man. Yeah, uh, that, that's her name. The character's name is Dell, the old older woman. Uh, hmm. Yeah, the the entire movie could have been avoided. At least it would have been ten minutes long had Dell had just been a normal human being. But obviously, every character in this movie has something wrong with them. The only person that doesn't have really anything wrong with her is the main character. But the main character is so oblivious to everything that's going on, and like. I don't know. As, there's some points in the movie where I kind of wanted to reach into the screen and slap Dill and be like, "Hey, you need to get this girl somewhere. She needs to find her family. She needs. To, you need to call the police. Something like you need to do something." But Dell is such a useless character. She, she, in, she acts like a nice character. She repaints her house, which is a good deed. But after that, she just she's just she's, just, she's a bitch throughout the whole movie. And like I don't know if bitch is the word for it. She just. The way she just acts towards Dickens, the way she acts towards Adele, and the way she acts towards her surroundings, like she is off. There's there is something off about this woman, but you don't know what that offness is. Like with Dickens, you know what's wrong with him. With the uh, July's, uh, with with the main character, you can you know what's wrong with her because she's just a little girl. But with Dell, they never say what's actually wrong with her. She got stung in the eye by a bee. So yeah, the entire movie could have been avoided had she just ran into normal people, but all the people she was around were just mentally handicapped in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Again, it really depends on how much of that do you think actually took place and how much was, was fantasy because you can always, you know, you can always take something that exists and paint it different colors. So I, I have no idea how much of that actually was supposed to have taken place. And I think it, it was left intentionally ambiguous. It, you know, you can create whatever you, you make your own story. Um, but uh, here, here's something, you, here's something I found yeah. on INDB. Uh, someone wrote a review for it says, there's no way for me to talk about this film without making it personal. I recall the age of eight wandering around the square desert of my parents' backyard, action figures in hand, thinking, thinking us up of stories, doing voices. Thailand plays that sort of, nostalgia but it balances it with darkness on visual visual on the horizon that cancels out whatever desires that a little girl would see so yeah i i guess i see the point like i guess we were all young once we uh i had a my grandparents a long time ago we had this farm and when i was like around eight or nine we uh, me and my brother would always just wander around this farm like aimlessly so i could see that resemblance of being a kid and just going off and do whatever you want and using your imagination. So yeah, may, maybe like 50% of this movie was the girl's just imagination. It didn't really take place. Uh, maybe those characters uh, Dickens and Dell did exist, but maybe in her mind, she over exaggerates what actually happens because uh, Terry Gilligan mentions that you're seeing this through the eyes of the little girl. Well, we didn't really see it through the eyes of Dickens or Dell and there's a lot of things in this movie that they don't explain very well. They don't explain what is actually Dickinson's deal. We know he's mentally handicapped. We know Dill, uh, Dell has an issue, but we don't know what those issues are. So we're just seeing it through her eyes. So it makes you wonder what actually happens in this movie. And like you said, maybe half this movie didn't really exist. I think it exists. She's just over-exaggerating in her mind because she doesn't understand sexual innuendos. She doesn't understand dynamite is really fucking dangerous. She, she doesn't understand that her dad is dead, or maybe she does. She doesn't want to accept it and just kind of ignores it. But the whole movie, she keeps mentioning, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And that's where my problem with Dell keeps coming in, because Adele could have helped this little girl, but she feeds her like once in the movie. After that, she's just off her rocker. Because every time she sees Dell, she's like, oh, are you a trespasser? No, it's me, Eliza Jane, like, Oh, okay. Everything's fine. Because every time Dell's on screen, you get like some sort of fear. You get some music in the background that says, hey, Dell is not really a good person. She should probably stay away from her. Right. And the first time you see her, she's all in black. She's all in black and she's singing a gospel song. She's singing about Jesus. Yeah. yeah I, th I think, you know, I mentioned the last line of the, of the film, uh, you know, at the end of the movie, there's a train wreck and she's like walking around the ruins of this train. And this woman that survived the train, the this train crash, she has her sit down next to her. She says, are you OK? She says, I'm hungry. She gives her an orange. I think it's an orange, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was an orange. And so she's eating the orange and there's all these fireflies flying around. And the fireflies are at the very beginning of the film. Um like the actually, I think it's the very first scene, right? The very first thing that you see 
is the this girl uh, playing in this just wrecked car, and I guess it's implied in the film that the it was a it was a bus or a truck or something, and the I guess bus, it's implied. Yeah. Yeah, it was a school bus, and I guess it was implied that it was it was wrecked by um, Dickens. Dickens. Like he had he had done something to try and derail this train. He was obsessed with this with this train. He, he called it this giant shark, and and but at the very beginning of the film, before even any credits, this you know this girl Jeliza, she runs into this this husk of a of a bus, and there's all these fireflies flying around. And the tra- and the train goes by, and the last line of the film, the, the, this old older woman that's sitting with her that had, that had just been in this train wreck, she says, um, she says, oh look at all the fireflies, and Jeliza says, um, she kind of looks a little off put, she looks like slightly irritated, and she says, they're my friends, you know, they have names. And I think that perfectly summarizes the whole film. It, it puts it into a pers- into perspective. And that's why I really think that a lot of the film didn't actually happen because she's basically saying that that they have identities, that they mean something, that they're – that they have a – they have a purpose and a place. They're my friends. They have names. You know, they, They're not just like they, like things that exist that are just – you comment on them. Oh, look at all these – you know, look at all the people. Look at all the fireflies or whatever. She's saying they have they, – they mean something. And I, I think a big part of, of her – because she was you know obviously going through trauma. She'd been emotionally abused. She'd been physically abused. I think it's, it's implied that, that, she, that she'd been sexually abused depending on how you interpret the, the, her relationship with, with uh, Dickens and how she interpreted it. But a well, a lot of things – sorry. A lot of things yeah. in this movie is really vague. We don't know – Everything that happened with between her and Dickens or Dell or everything that happened between her and uh, her dad or what exactly she was doing on that land the entire time. One thing though, I was interested though. Uh, I was interested in like why that final shot of the movie, the final, the final shot of the movie where she's looking at the fireflies and then her eyes glow and that's the end of the movie. I just. Yeah, I'm trying to wonder what Terry Gilligan's trying to say. Like throughout the entire film, like what what is what does that mean? Like was there something off about her the entire time? Like because she's like, oh, they're my friends, you know. Then the movie just ends. But there's something about her eyes that they focus on so much, but they don't really do that throughout the entire film. So I'm just wondering right. why he chose but the end like that. It's it's because everything was seen through her eyes, and to her, the fireflies had significance. They meant something to her because she. She had been neglected her whole life. She was basically abandoned by both of her parents, and her father may have committed suicide. I, I'm not sure what I think about that, but her father may have, have taken an, an, an overdose of heroin intentionally. I mean, she's the one that prepared it, but he's the one that gave it to her. And you remember he told her, like, don't skimp on dad or something, telling her, like, you know, use all of it or don't, don't you know, don't give me just a little bit. I want a lot of it. Yeah. And I'm I'm not I'm not sure about that, but he definitely abandoned her one way or the other. And to to her, she was like nameless. She was a nameless, you know, she was a nameless child that was just wandering around in this big world that didn't make much sense to her because she, you know she's a little kid, and she did not she she didn't mean anything to anybody. And I think it, it, to project that and to give sort of comfort or to give names to parts of nature or the things that she saw or the things that she experienced that was what that was a big part of of what the movie was about was that you know she was she, that these things had importance that they weren't just uh, uh they weren't inconsequential because she herself felt inconsequential i i think that 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 last shot and the last just that last scene about the fireflies and her conversation with that woman i think that that's what that was sort of going toward that's just how i interpreted it uh, yeah, like, uh, so I was on the, uh, I'm on the fence if I think this is a good movie or not. I, I know why people didn't like this movie. I like it for my own reasons because I think it has a lot of artistic value. I would watch it again a few times, but I also, I don't see the controversy that much because I think there are actually far worse films than this movie. Yeah, this movie is fucked up, but it's definitely not on par with a Serbian film or, Human Centipede and those type of movies. It's not a snuff film. It just has a lot of disturbing art- artistic uh, scenery. 
And I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm still trying to wonder what Terry Gilligan is, was trying to say, even though it, he's said it repeatedly that this is through the eyes of a kid, that this is just innocence. But there, there's just some imagery and some parts of this movie that make no sense that you have to kind of interpret it on yourself versus movies nowadays most, most most movies these days will tell you what's going on in the movie but i like movies that have that vagueness that gets you thinking especially with endings because after the movie's over i wonder what happens to her at at the end does she get adopted by that lady from the train uh does did anyone ever find her father does anyone ever figure out what what happened does she grow up a normal life and come back years later like oh my god like what the fuck happened um does anybody not call the police on Dell because Dell probably deserves to be in a mental hospital somewhere um yeah or do they ever find out what happens with Dickens body because I'm assuming that he did blow himself up if he was a real person so th there's just a lot of questions this movie leaves you. It just leaves you wondering what happens to her after. And I think that's good because it made me actually care for this character. It, it made me care for this person I barely knew. And when a movie does that, it, you know it did something right. If I care for someone that much that I don't even know, then obviously it's doing something right. Right. Yeah. And I think... Oh, ow. Sorry, you made me... Uh, oh, okay. Um, I think... That you, you were talking about, you know, the shock value, and you didn't understand why people, uh, why people thought that it was controversial. But I, I think that, you know, you, you said you cared about the character. I think that's the main difference between um, any kind of shock, shock value or uh, torture porn type horror film, like, or a body horror film, like Human Centipede or Serbian film or Salo or whatever. Hostel or Saw, those kind of films, you don't really care about the characters, and it doesn't present it in a way where where there's anything that's at stake. I mean, it it does, but the the people in horror films are expendable. It, it they don't matter, you know. Like you can normally watch the very beginning of a horror film and say, yeah, he's going to die. He's going to die. She's going to die. You know, like that. It's, it's so, and you're expecting that. So with a film like this, which is not uh, a conventional horror film, it's, I think it's labeled as horror fantasy, but it's not a conventional horror film. It has horror elements to it, but I think that the, the, uh, the suggestion of the grotesqueness of it, the suggestion of the of the relationship between the little girl and the the mentally handicapped guy, the suggestion of it is much more poignant than just pushing it on your face, like the baby scene in a Serbian film. That's not shocking because it's just stupid. It's like, yeah. oh, what's the worst thing that I can do? Oh, ha ha! Look, you know, look what I'm doing to this baby. It's like that. That's stupid because it takes the shock out of it when you know that somebody's presenting it to you just for pure shock. But if there's some kind of emotional connection or, or attachment or there's something, you know what it is? If there's something being said, if there's something of importance or something of value that's being conveyed by that shock, it has much more there, it's much more shocking than if it's just like, oh, look at this gross thing I'm doing. You know what I mean? I think that's the, yeah. that's the reason that, that, it, that it unsettled people, also because it was a, it was a child. Uh, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, going back to a Serbian film, uh, that whole baby sequence, I had to stop the movie for at least 30 minutes just to compose myself. I was like, what the? Because I, I wasn't expecting it. And uh, yeah, like that really, that made me want to throw up. Like, yeah, it just a Serbian film. It, it, you're right. It is a shit movie. Um, I had to finish it because I just had this thing where I had to at least watch one bad horror movie like that. But you said this is labeled a horror film, but I don't know. I, I don't see it as a horror film. I I, uh, I I guess dark fantasy would be more would be a better explanation. If it is labeled a horror film, I don't know. I I, I can't see it as a horror film, even though. Some people might see it that way. Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, earlier in the movie when she's with her dad and her mom, her dad goes to turn off the lights, and you see like a moving shadow. And she mentions, hey, dad, can you keep the lights on? And he goes, sure. And he turns the lights off anyways and walks away. Is that supposed to hint like at her imagination? Or 
like it, it makes you think like there's something else that's going on that she's going to be haunted by this shadow but it's never mentioned again there's a lot of parts of this movie that they show that is never mentioned again like a uh like what happens when the in their sub in the submarine when they go to Dickens little playhouse submarine and they talk about these bikes and it's never mentioned again and then there's that other character that goes and has sex with Dale never mentioned again there's a lot of parts of this movie that they show but it's never mentioned again i just thought that was an interesting aspect uh especially with the grandma the grandma is not in this film but she's mentioned throughout the whole film like oh the grandma this is grandma's house oh like the grandma was used to here but she fell down the stairs uh yeah th there's a lot i could say about this film but i think in the end i actually did enjoy it a lot more than other people uh i i wouldn't say it's my favorite film of all time like i said but it's definitely something i would watch again i think it has a lot of artistic value so yeah i i i i love it i i don't it's not a film that i that i want to watch again <laughs> i've seen it three times now and it's it's an unpleasant film to sit through but like you said the cinematography is brilliant um just Terry Gilliam is uh, his cinematography is always good. I think the cinematography in Fear and Loathing is is incredible. The Fisher King, I don't know if you've seen the Fisher King. I, I don't. No, Actually, I haven't seen that. I'll probably um, watch that next. Uh, oh yeah, it's a great film. It's not. It's not. All of his films are pretty dark. I, they're not nearly as dark as this one, but all of his films have kind of a, that sort of a balance between comedy and darkness, and somehow the comedy makes the darkness more dark, <laughs> because yeah, it's uh, like, what? I shouldn't... I, it, oh, sorry. Oh, you can keep going. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. No, it, it's cool. I was just saying that, you know, uh, the comedy makes it feel like you're kind of stuck in the middle of the, of these two of these two opposing forces. Like, should I laugh at this? Because it's presented as comedy, and it almost makes it feel kind of tasteless. And I think it, it, I don't know. It brings out the darkness in something, whereas just pure horror, at least you know what to expect. So there's no conflicting emotions. Well, I mean, if you think about it, uh, Terry Gilliam's uh, his films. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. But uh, his films... Gilliam. If, Gilliam. 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 I keep saying Gilligan. Gilliam. Gilliam. But uh, his films, yeah. if you think about it, like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, what was that movie actually about? It's about really two guys on drugs that go to Vegas. There's no real plot. His movies have no real plot. They're all just like artistically filmed. And I guess I wouldn't really call that a plot. You know, like, a plot in a movie is when, okay, a character wants to do this, wants to go from point A to point B. But in Fear and Loathing, they're not trying to do anything. They're just walking around Vegas. And this in Thailand, she's not the character. Uh, Jeliza, uh, I can't, oh, I forgot her name. Yeah, the main character in Thailand, Jeliza she Rose. doesn't. Jeliza Rose. I don't know why I forgot her name, but she doesn't really try to do anything. So all his movies, like the characters, aren't really trying. I mean, that's what a plot is: trying to do something that the character is doing. But in his movies, there's no plot. That's that's. I mean, I'm probably wrong. I probably just don't see it. Well, with Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is based on a book by Hunter S. Thompson, who oh, yeah, is a, that, yeah. A, a yeah. So he and it's actually of every movie I've seen that's based on a book, it's the most perfect adaptation of a book. It's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is pretty much the book that Hunter S. Thompson wrote word for word. I mean, it's it's it, there's no deviation. The only thing I remember that was in the movie that wasn't in the book was when um was when the cop who was played by – ah, oh, his name is escaping me. Big tooth guy, crazy guy. Um, I can't oh, he tries to I'm kiss not... him? He's like, all right. Yeah, like, yeah. Give me He's some... like, can I, have a little, can I have a little kiss before before we go? That That's not in the book, and I think that's the only thing that's not in the book. But the rest is just – is um, yeah, the rest is, is, is verbatim. And that movie does have a plot. It's just it's difficult to discern because it's so muddled down with all the with all the psychedelic stuff that goes on. That Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is about two people trying to find the heart of the American dream. It, and it's about dis, the disillusionment of it's about how fake the American dream really is, especially in the 1960s, 1960s and 70s. The the thing is I mean, it doesn't take place in the '60s and '70s, but it's about it's about like burnout hippies from the '60s, and they get into a lot of you know when the like Hunter S. Thompson said that the the piece that he wrote in that book about when the um, 
It's called the I think it's called the wave speech. He called it when the he, he talked about the the movement of the 1960s and all the hippies and everybody thought that they were they were doing these big revolutionary things. And, you know, eventually it just kind of like plateaued and then they all started sinking down and the whole movement just kind of went away. And they they were just all a bunch of burnout cripples by that point, like psychological or mental cripples. And the, um, that, the movie was kind of the – was like – the end of all of that, you know, all these these failed seekers and people that people that, you know, they had pretty much burnt themselves out on this this fake nonsensical, you know, chemical induced peace and love ideology that didn't work out. And then the so the film the film dealt with like American consumerism and just, you know, everything's very colorful and everything's very much in excess and these two dudes still trying to chase uh, this basically this fantasy, but the thing is the correlations between those two films and they're filmed, uh, you know, they were filmed next to each other. There was a big gap in between, but fear, it was fear and loathing was filmed first and then Thailand or I, it may have been. And then he did another film that was really horrible. I guess the brothers Grimm, I think is, was that the next one that he did? I think. Yeah. Brothers Grimm. And, uh, yeah. So the, but they're both kind of about this. They both focus on the same themes because Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas could really, in some ways, be looked at as a fantasy film. A lot of the things that happen in the movie are pretty ambiguous. You don't know what's really happening and what's just drug induced paranoia. Um, you know, especially if you're if you've ever done any of those kind of drugs that they were doing in that movie, like you understand a little bit more the the oh, yeah, way I've never... that they. Oh, okay. I was like, I've well, never done those type ex- of drugs. I wouldn't know. The way that they experience everything is, you know, it's it's pretty accurate. And a lot of times you come back from an experience like that and you tell a story and you might not really be telling the story of what actually took place. Um. So, and the yeah. Tideland is the same thing. It's kind of this story that probably happened, but it's filtered very heavily through the lens of somebody who is emotionally traumatized and also is a little kid. So, um, I, I think both films have that sort of thematic element of they're both very long films. They're both very. When you're done with either of those movies, you feel like you've really sat through something. You've really endured something, you know. <laughs> and they both are yeah. dark, dark comedies as well. That's something I'll give Terry Gilligan. Uh, is that all his movies? Yeah, whenever I'm done with the movie, I feel like I've experienced that movie. It, even the Brothers Grimm wasn't that great of a movie. At the end of it, he just has this way of making a movie that you just feel like you experience that entire situation. Um, yeah, I, I see a lot of similarities between Thailand and Fear and Loathing. I, I guess this is just me, but I just I see like a uh, Johnny Depp's character. He also seems very paranoid, very imaginative, especially when he's in the car and he stole like a bunch of hotel equipment or hotel stuff, puts it in his back seat and he keeps like trying to hide it. Like, what if people saw that I stole this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I thought that was pretty funny. But yeah, like I, I watched Fear of Loathing for uh, years. I've seen I've seen it dozens of times and the, I, I'm not a big Hunter S. Thompson fan, so I know he has a big following. But every time I try, I, I like watching movies. I don't like reading novels that much. I, I do read a lot of novels, though. But uh, every time I watch Fear of Loathing, I was always trying to figure out what is this movie actually about? Like, I know it has a big cult following, but I can never understand it. The same thing with Thailand. I can see when people are watching it, they're not going to know what is this movie actually about? What What is it even trying to say? And Terry Gilligan, he just has that way of making movies or it makes you just question everything. It makes you question what happens with Dick and uh, why was Johnny Depp's character acting like that? Uh, what happens with uh, the main character of both movies? Yeah. Yeah. He's a good, I, I really, I really like his, uh, I like his films. I just definitely he's, um, He's uncompromising. I mean, in terms of, in terms of how he presents things, and when you're somebody like that, because you know he got his start uh, on uh, Monty Python. He got his start making. Uh, he did animations on Monty Python, and I don't oh, know I if you ever watched Monty Python, but he's oh, a well-known have. guy. He doesn't need you know he doesn't need validation yeah. from anybody. So I, I appreciate was a hamster. his films. <laughs> was it your mother was a hamster and your father was something? Uh, I haven't seen Monty <laughs> Python in years. Uh, what movie on, should I'm, we talk uh, about next, though? What? 
Okay, I want to I want to just uh before we before we finish up, I want to recommend the Fisher King. I was talking about it before. You like Jeff Bridges? He was he's the main. It's a it, it stars Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges. Um, it was directed by Terry Gilliam. I don't think it was written by him though. It, it's like a comedy drama, but it's pretty dark. Um, it it's not. I we wouldn't discuss it here because it's definitely not a horror film. But his like. You you just need to watch it. It's really it's really good, and it's very it takes a very weird turn kind of toward the middle. And it's it's an odd it's a very odd film. I mean, we can we can still but, talk yeah. about it here. It's no no big deal. It's it's called the Fisher. The Fisher King. The Fisher King. Okay. It, I think yeah, I've heard of that movie. But I don't know if I've seen it. I I just got done watching a bunch of Tales from the Crypt. Like I said, I was watching a lot of Twilight Zone recently, and then I got tired of that, so I started watching Tales from the Crypt, and ended up, I actually like Tales from the Crypt way more than I do the Twilight Zone at the moment. It's just, there's a lot of ridiculousness to that TV show. That's all film, like, it's a film like a comedy, but it's not a comedy. I just, I want to talk about Tales from the Crypt so much, and uh, I tried watching that with a few of my Chinese friends, and they just couldn't stand it. They, they were horrified. Uh, so, <laughs> Show them Creep Show. Oh yeah, creep show. Oh, forgot about that. I forgot about that too. That's a TV. There's a that's a movie and a TV show. I think also, right? Or am I wrong? Um, I'm not sure. The, it was a collaboration between George Romero and Stephen King and a few other, a few other prominent horror movie or horror just horror genre people at the time. I think it was 1990s. There are two of them, or there may have been three of them, but I've only seen two of them, and they're kind of like. Just you know, many stories within a, you know a whole movie, but uh, they, it kind of reminds me reminds me a little bit of Tales from the Crypt. Those are fun. Those yeah. are fun movies. Yeah. Did you did you like Tales from the Crypt TV show? Yeah, I never really watched it that much, but but I, I enjoyed it when I did watch it. I'm not that familiar with it though. I honestly just I I don't watch a lot of TV, and I haven't in my life watched a lot of TV. Um, that's, that's I was a really good thing. into the horror. Yeah, probably. I was really into horror, like the horror genre when I was a, when I was a kid and when I was a teenager and like early twenties. So I watched a lot of horror movies, but, um, I don't know. I never really got into TV. I like mystery science theater 3000. I like that a lot, but I mean, that makes well, sense because yeah. it is a TV show with that's just movies, you know, they're just watching movies. So I wouldn't really say I like I'm a show. big avid TV show fan or there are certain shows I will watch like Tales from the Crypt, Game of Thrones. There's, there's a good handful of shows, but I won't watch everything. Uh, just for an example, the the new Avengers movie came out and I'm like, I feel like I'm the only person on the planet that was not excited to go see that. I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to wait till Monday. Uh, I'm sure it's a good film. I, I don't know. I just... Like I'm not, I'm never really in a rush to go see movies. I'll, I'll take my time, wait a couple of days, wait about a week for it to get out. Because when you go to the theater these days, they're so packed. I just hate going to the theater nowadays. Everyone's like a fucking asshole, but that's just me. Uh, so what, what do you think of Thailand? Uh, overall, did you like it or not? Yeah, I, I, I do like it. I like it a lot. I, the first time I saw it, I was, I was blown away by it. Um. Because I think I like the the challenging. I don't really it, when I watch a movie if it's formulaic or if it's just like whatever. If it's a film that's forgettable, I am gonna forget about it, and it just doesn't really mean much to me. I can watch a film as a as a piece of entertainment and enjoy it without really thinking that it's that it's a good film, and then vice versa. I can watch a film that I really didn't enjoy. But that I recognize is is a, is a that has value that has some kind of artistic value that surpasses most films, and with Tideland, I don't really enjoy watching it. Like there's a lot of times when you're just sitting there, like uh, the same with Happiness. Like you just watch Todd Solon's Happiness. Like the same with that movie it, or any Todd Solon's films. You just kind of watch it and cringe and think, oh my god. But there is a but they're good films. You know they they're a they have a message, they have a meaning, there's a purpose behind them. And I think with Tideland, 
I like it, and I've recommended it to people that that did not like it. I, I don't think I think you're the only person I've recommended it to that that actually said that he like kind of liked it. <laughs> but most people that watch it, the first time I watched it, I watched it with someone, and she was unimpressed. She refused to watch all of it with me, so I had to watch the rest of it later. Um, and I think that that extreme reaction from people. I don't know. I think that's valuable. You know, when you've watched a, a movie and you feel something, if you feel as long as the thing you're feeling isn't just like, oh, that was a waste of time because the movie was pointless. That's not a good fe- that's a strong reaction, but it's not a good reaction. Like it's not it's not a reaction that has any kind of value. But to watch a film and to say I am very conflicted about about this movie and how it makes me feel. And there's some kind of really complicated emotion that makes me feel, but I don't understand it. I think that's valuable. And that's how I feel about Tideland. It's, it's, it, there's a very complex sort of contradictory emotion that it stirs up in me, but I could, I could never say that it, that it did not have an effect on me, an emotional effect on me. So I, I think it's a good film. Uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, I see why people didn't like it. I just, I personally don't think it's that bad of a movie, like that disturbing. I think there are far, I've seen a lot of movies. I think there are far worse disturbing movies, uh, than this. But as I said, I see why people didn't like it. I I would watch it maybe a few more times. I would really have no reason. I would probably just watch it again just to watch for the visuals or just make sure I understood what happened in the movie. Um, yeah, I, I was intrigued by it. I, like I said, I, I see why people didn't like it, but at the same time, it's not that bad of a film, in, in my opinion. Like, it's not that disturbing. I've seen more disturbing shit. It does have some grotesque things in the film. And I think uh, for any moviegoer, even if you don't like a movie, you should at least try to finish it. Like, try to see if you like it. Uh, if you don't like it, you can always just never watch it again. Uh, yeah, so I like watching movies with people that will at least try to finish the movie, no matter how fucked up it is. But... At the end of the day, it's not that bad of a film. If I have, if I had to get a rating, a scale of one to ten, I give it about an eight. Like it's not good, it's not bad. Like eight, eight's a pretty decent rating. It's not not like a ten or anything, but yeah, I, I was really impressed with the actress. Really impressed with Terry Gillian. I was really impressed with the the visuals, and that's pretty much it. Like everything else was was disturbing, but I just think at the end of the day, there are far worse films in disturbing value than this. Especially like the Saw films. The Saw films are just snuff films. And uh, Serbian film is that's a god awful movie, but yeah, it's not that bad of a film. Have, you, have you seen Salo? Mm, I think I, I I might have. If I see like a screenshot of it, I I probably will remember the movie. I've seen Martyrs. I, I don't know if you've seen Martyrs. Uh, yeah, I've seen Martyrs. Salo is is a a remake or not a remake, an an adaptation of the Marquis de Sade book, The One Hundred and Twenty Days of Sodom. Mm-hmm. It's a French film, or no, no, it was a French book. It wasn't a French film. Yeah, if you want it, that's like the the prototype of the disturbing film. I don't want to get too much into that, but I do want to say that I apologize for not remembering this guy's name. He, of course, his name is Gary Busey, the cop that pulls over uh, Hunter S. Thompson's character in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and asks him for a kiss. It's Gary Busey. Oh, I didn't realize that. That. Gary Busey, he's a he's kind of an insane guy all by himself. That, that reminds oh, me, yeah. there's a lot of a lot of actors in uh Gary uh, Terry Gilligan's movies. They all have like something off about them, <laughs> uh, like not too crazy or anything like that. You have Gary Busey, and you have a uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Benicio del Toro's in Fear and Loathing, also right? Yeah, and yeah. yeah, they all have something off about them as actors, and I just I think that's an interesting choice. Uh, I think the only person that's really made it. The only actually no, it's Jeff Bridges and Johnny Depp. Other than that, everyone else is kind of like a low profile actor in all his movies. Dude, Johnny Depp was Hunter S. Thompson, though. Man, he like he nailed that part. There's actually another film uh about Hunter S. Thompson that's called Where the Buffalo Roam. Oh yeah. Uh, it was it's Bill Murray plays Hunter S. Thompson, and he does a really good job. Like a is he's kind of a younger less uh intense hunter s thompson and it's um it's not the same story but it's 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 ba- it's still based on on um it's based on his life i think it's based on it's based on one of his books or a couple of his books put together but it's it's a pretty good film it's not as good as fear and loathing but i think hunter s thompson is a really difficult character to play and they both did 
they both did a fantastic job. I'm not a fan of Johnny Depp, but I, that's the best performance that he's given, hands down. I think. Yeah, I, I don't. I really don't understand uh, the whole Hunter S. Hunter S. Thompson thing. Like I said, I never really read his book, so when I saw Fear and Loathing, I didn't really understand like what the character of Hunter S. Thompson was supposed to be. Was supposed to be actually, I've seen. Uh, when we're the Buffalo room, I, I actually saw like maybe 10 minutes of it, but I turned it off. Like I said, I just, I really didn't get, I, I guess I grew up, I, I just missed it, right? Like I missed the whole Hunter S. Thompson thing. Like somehow everyone else was like, oh, it's so cool. It's about Hunter S. Thompson. I'm like, yeah, I know who that is, but what about Hunter S. Thompson? So I guess I'm the only person on the planet that just didn't really get that. So I guess I got to take the time one day to actually try to read his books or at least try to watch all his movies just to understand it. But I just feel like I'm the only person that really that really missed it, you know? Yeah. He, he, he's written a bunch of books, but he wrote fear and loathing on the campaign trail, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Um, he wrote a book about, uh, he spent some time, or they made a documentary film also about hell's angels. So he spent some yeah. time with a motorcycle gang. Um, he wrote, a he, he wrote about American politics. He wrote about sports. He was a journalist. Um, that did not play by the rules. Uh, he was known. He was he was a drug addict, but he wasn't just a drug addict. He he incorporated his drug use in his work, uh, and his style of journalism was like he instead of going to an event and writing about the event, he went to the event and he wrote about himself at the event and he sort of incorporated his story and the crazy stuff he was doing into the into the event. He called it gonzo journalism. I'm really simplifying it, but he just had a, a very unique style of a lot of people have tried to have tried to imitate what he did, but he he, he was a really, really good writer. Um, he was obviously off his hinges. He ended up committing suicide because he didn't want to suffer. He had some, uh, he was sick and, uh, he ended up shooting himself and his, actually his ashes were blasted from a cannon by Johnny Depp. Him and Johnny Depp were good friends because he spent some time with Johnny Depp when Johnny Depp was preparing for his role in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And they stayed in touch, and so he wanted to have his ashes blasted out of a cannon after he died, and so Johnny Depp spent like five million dollars or something setting this up, and he actually did it. That's impressive. Yeah, I, actually, I knew about the whole cannon thing that him and Johnny Depp were friends, but uh, yeah, I guess we could talk about Hunter S. Thompson another time. We're gonna talk about the Fisher King, I guess, next week. Uh, is there anything else you want to say before we go? Um, no, I'm, I'm good. I recommend, I recommend the movie though. If anyone, you know, it's challenging. It's Tideland is challenging and it's not always pleasant to watch, but I think, I don't know. I like it. And also I want to say, I talked about the bad reviews before. There are not just bad reviews, but there are no mixed reviews. I mean, there are no reviews that, that I could find that were it was okay. It was an all right movie. People either really enjoyed it and thought it was brilliant or they really hated it. <laughs> But I didn't find any in-between reviews, so I think it's just one of those very polarizing films. You know, you're either going to like it or you're going to hate it. Yeah, Terry Gilliam, he says that at, in his intro that's not in the film for some reason anymore. But he says that, like, you're either going to hate this movie or, luckily, some of you are going to like it. Uh, yeah, I, I will say that I did like it. Uh, yeah. I keep repeating that I know why people didn't like it, but I, I do recommend this movie for anyone that likes artistic value movies or, like, disturbing films but this is kind of borderline disturbing i people say that it's disturbing but i i don't see it like being that disturbing I just, like i said there's far worse ones but yeah I, I would recommend it to people i don't think it's a film for everyone i think a lot of people are gonna hate it but i'm sure there's a lot of movie goers are, goers out there that will love this movie so anyways man i'm gonna go for now uh i guess we'll see you next week right all right cool yeah see you then bye bye That's okay it. peace 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 out